terms of a, uh, a growing awareness, kind of be within TransAid and also within the uh, the wider development sector, of the value of uh, good knowledge sharing practices. And uh, we realised that the more we were sharing, um, the more openly we were sharing, the more people were getting in touch with us, and the bigger impact we could have, and the more we could extend our reach. And so since then, we've been building the amount of material that we're able to share, making sure that um, all of our uh, case studies and the tools that we use and the manuals that we use uh, in a user-friendly format, um, and that they're able to be shared widely. And uh, so we've been building up that amount of material, and I'll be showing you some examples later. Um, up until the point in October 2015, where we were able to launch our new knowledge centre, uh, which I'll be showing you later, and, uh, and we have a, a wide range of resources available on there. So Transa's knowledge sharing process, I'll just tell you a little bit about the, um, the processes that go on at Transate uh, in order to share our knowledge. So uh, this picture represents the, uh, the knowledge that, um, that we gain from the field and, uh, and working with our partners. And uh, so the knowledge that is contained in somebody's head, it's important that we're then able to capture this and translate it into the form of a guide or a tool or a set of instructions. And then the most important part is that this, um, this knowledge is then able to be shared and um, shared in as widely as possible and in multiple formats in order to make it accessible to everybody. And um, it's important that this knowledge reaches the right and relevant people because uh, if it can be, um, because then programs can be improved uh, with the. And I think we're experiencing a slight delay. I don't know if people um, are having an issue with the visual. Um, can you can you just um, type up uh, everybody to see if if the visual is catching up with the sound, so to speak. So I'll just while we're waiting for the uh, visual to catch up, um, I'll just explain a little bit more about, uh, about what I mean about making it accessible to everybody. Um, this involves making sure that it's available in multiple language, languages, uh, which, we're, um, which we're aiming towards at the moment. We've translated a number of our technical case studies into French. I believe we, we have a French speaker on our, on our call today, and so uh, they'll be pleased to know that we do have quite a few materials available in French now. And uh, also making sure that we're not just restricted to the internet, as we understand that a lot of areas don't actually have access to the internet. So, um, so making sure that we have printed copies when internet isn't available and ensuring that our program managers who are working out in the field have these printed copies um, when they're working, uh, when they're going to conferences and workshops, meetings with other people, so that they can share them that way as well. So just to give you a, um, a kind of tangible example of uh, knowledge flows between countries, um, I just thought it would be quite good to use this example. So these are some photos that I took while I was in Zambia. Um, this is at a driver training institution, and you'll see there that there's a, um, once the, the photos have come up, I understand there is a little bit of a delay, which uh, I apologise. So I'm sorry if I go racing ahead before you've actually seen the photo. Um, but you will see soon a uh, photo of um, a driver trainer teaching his class safe driving practices. And um, he's been working, uh, teaching driving, um, safe driving in an African context for a, uh, for a number of years. And if that experience that he has and all that knowledge can be captured, then it can be shared beyond Zambia and throughout Africa and then across the globe. And um, it's also important that this knowledge flows both ways, um, that it can be built upon and, uh, and improved through the process, and uh, as times change, kind of made more relevant over time. So just to tell you a little bit about our um, audiences and who we want to reach with our knowledge and resources. So we, uh, this slide here shows a list of the audi audiences that might find our knowledge useful. 
to their work and uh, and we think that from small local NGOs to the World Bank we have resources that are worth sharing that could add a lot of value to the work of other organisations and likewise uh, we hope that the open sharing of this knowledge will build bridges between organisations and that then we can learn from the practices of others and uh, this knowledge can be built and improved. Um, hold on a second. Um, I think Ilona, you had your hand raised. Sorry, we're having a little technical difficulty here. Ilona, can you hear us? I can hear you. Um, I just wanted to say that I don't seem to have an option to to type any feedback. The only sign that I have is the um, putting my hand up. Oh, I see. You don't have the question mark or the um, the arrow. I don't have a question mark or an arrow. Ah, okay. That's fine. That's fine. Um, we we can uh, take your question now if you'd like. I uh, no. I just wanted to give the response that uh, my uh, the 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 slides for me are actually in time with the audio. So oh, okay, perfect. Fine. That's all I wanted to let you know. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. That's fine, I think. So, so we're going to take a couple of questions uh, now, and uh, I can see that um, Holly actually has a question. Catherine. Oh, sorry, Catherine. Catherine has a question. Um, so, Catherine, do you want to go ahead? I've just unmuted you. Catherine Kilfeda. Um, sorry, I didn't have a question. Okay, sorry, no. <laughs> okay, it's it's more about uh, whether the visuals were actually in sync with the, the audio. Okay, that's brilliant. Um, so th does anyone um, at this point have any questions about, uh, you know, just what what we do in terms of knowledge sharing, how we do it, why we decided to to uh, go ahead and share things so so widely. Um, I'm just waiting to see if anybody puts their hand up or, oh, here we go, or oh, unless, so Nasiru, I can see that you've got your hand up, I don't know if it was to do with the visual again or. Yeah, yeah. Um, actually, I'm wondering, um, you know, in terms of the uh, translation of the, you know, knowledge, uh, you know, uh, so I'm wondering, uh, the provision uh, the I'm, I'm very sorry, Nasiru. We seem to have a lot of echo. Um, and and yeah. I, I could hear, I could hear your question was about um, translation of documents, right? Yeah, into local language. In local languages, yes. Maybe, yeah. So we, um, yeah, about our translation in local languages. What we um, try to do is, uh, if we have, uh, there's a few good examples actually from the project in Nigeria where we've had tools which are developed in uh, in Hausa, and um, and then we've been able to share those uh, online. So, um, oh. Audio connection's been lost. Yes, I'm not sure whether people can hear us at the moment. We seem to be experiencing some issues. Hmm. Okay. Okay, so we're back. Good. Sorry, we, we lost you for a second there. I think it's back now. Um, so as I was saying, we um, yes, that's a very good question about the translation of uh, tools into local languages. So we. Um, uh, there's a few examples, uh, especially in the Nigeria project, where we have some tools which we've developed in uh, Hausa um, for use in, in that specific region. And we make sure that those are available to share online as well. Um, we, uh, we often try to translate them into English as well, um, and uh, so that they're not just in the, in the local language. Um, but yes, we do make those available. So we have a few examples of tools that are in Hausa and a couple of tools that are also in Swahili from when we've worked in Tanzania. Thank you, Holly. 
Um, I can see that Sarah and Tom had their hand raised, so let's see. Uh, Sarah, did you have a question? Hi. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, I just wanted to, uh, to ask a question. The, the, the process started in April 2012 and you finished in, in October 2015, so obviously some of that time would have been spent gathering the information you wanted for the Knowledge Centre. Were, were, were there any other steps that you needed to take to get from point A to point B? Um, yes, so we, um, so I guess, yeah, most of the time was spent um, building up the material, so we've been around for um, 17 years and we have a lot of, a lot of our old projects are kind of typed up in, in massive folders, so the first step was making sure that those are all um, that those are all turned into technical case studies uh, so so yeah so the first step was technical case studies really so we uh, it was turning our historical projects into um two page outlines um that we that can then be shared with uh, with other people so then we moved on from technical case studies to tools uh, making sure that um we uh, we got in touch with our project managers and ask them what material is most useful to them when they're working on a specific project and uh, and then sending it over to me so that then uh, so we developed a specific format that the tools are put in which i'll show you later um and uh, and making sure that they're put in that specific um user-friendly format as well and so those were two key stages really and uh, and then it was also about targeting the uh, the people that we think this kind of information, this knowledge would be most useful to uh, the most relevant people and, uh, and gaining some feedback from them about the kind of things that they would like to see. And, uh, and yeah, and then also the development of the Knowledge Centre on the new website and making sure that that's user friendly so that people can, can find the right documents that they, that they want access to. Thank you, Holly. Sarah, did, did that answer your question? It does, yes, thank you very much. Brilliant. Uh, so I think, uh, Tom, uh, you had a, a question for us. Oh, yes, yes, thank you. Um, I was just wondering, is there any, this releasing your, international, your, your intellectual property and opening up all the information you have, did you see that as quite a brave decision to make? Because it also opens up all your work to analysis, potential criticism. Because I'm sure that any organization has parts that don't work quite as well as they should. Um, so whether you saw that as kind of a, a very brave step to take as an organization. Uh, yeah, I think I think we did see it as quite a brave step to take. But I think the, the thinking behind it was that the, the benefits of, um, of sharing our knowledge are likely to greatly outweigh the, uh, the risks, really. And I think that... Um, that yeah as i said we could hugely increase our impact and um and yeah we noticed that the more we shared more people got in touch and we were getting some really good feedback from people and and so far it's had a an entirely positive well almost entirely positive response really and um and and i think that i'm part of this uh oh and as well as catherine uh, kilfeder on the call part of the uh, knowledge management network which um is a group of um, people working in knowledge management from uh, international NGOs, and I think there is a an overall rec recognition that it is something that's important to do and something that we should be doing more of. But I think it is held back by this uh, by this fear of um, of risk, really. Of um, yeah, because the. I can totally understand that, and especially with uh, a lot of these bigger organisations. But yeah, we we believe that. Um, that it's important to share openly and it's important to be honest as well. Like a lot of our technical case studies um, share some of the things which perhaps didn't go so well. Um, and But then we also recommend ways that it could be improved for the future as well. So. Thank you very much, Holly. Tom, did that answer your question okay? Yes, thank you very much. That's very interesting. Thank you. Brilliant. Um, Robin, Robin Stafford, I think you have a question for us. Robin? Yes, I think the question would be related to, uh, and you to answer the question, Holly, thank you, that way you started, although I, I admit I had some inside knowledge. I'm thinking forward then to what is it you think you might be doing differently now to other organisations uh, on the basis that it's, it's like a continuous process of 
adding material? Yeah, are there things that you're doing differently, do you think, to an organization that's just running projects and not capturing knowledge? Um, yeah, I think so. I think we're, um, we're uh, it's, it's an ongoing process, really, but the stage we're at now is trying to make sure that, um, that it is sustainable and that it's something that everybody within TransAid is aware of, that this is something that we do. We need to capture this knowledge and that it um, shouldn't be lost. So all the project managers are aware that, uh, that when they are implementing um, there's certain things which uh, which they need to do, which is um, make sure that their tools are available to share, and um, and also that uh, technical case studies are written up about the um, about the learning that's happened. I think, yeah, I think in terms of other organisations, I'm not really sure how much this happens in in other organisations because, as I was saying before, I think a lot of people get a bit put off by the risks and things, but um, but yeah, I know that there are other organizations where this is a huge, huge push as well. Robin, sorry, you've got your hand up. Uh, did you have a follow-up question? I, no, I didn't. In fact, no, that, it, it's sort of more, more or less what I uh, expect. Uh, and I was very much struck by Tom's point uh, about how people might feel defensive about it. And it's certainly been my own observation of the development sector that perhaps the work that's been done in the past, dominated by the academic world, has been more about, as I would put it, critical theory than constructive practice. And more thinking about how does this work in theory, rather than saying, how does that work in practice? What can we learn from it? And what do we do differently and better next time? With a sort of open attitude of continuous improvement, rather than wanting to criticize things. So I can completely relate to Tom's point. Yeah. <laughs> yes, me too. <laughs> Definitely. Thank you very much, Robin. Oh, and you've got your hand up again. <laughs> sorry. No, I, put it, I thought I put it down. <laughs> you put it down. Okay, sorry. <laughs> All right. I think um, Catherine, I saw, had uh, her hand up. Catherine. Um, yes, I yeah, hi. Sorry, I do have. I actually do have a question. Um, I just have a question about um, if you could kind of talk us through the if whether there was a culture shift within um, your organization, and it, I imagine there must have been to, to have it streamlined and sort of um, have everybody thinking about knowledge management. And I'm, I was just looking at your strategy earlier and noticed that that one example is that each of the programs people have to develop these uh, case studies and the onus is in them to develop them and to maintain contacts and make sure they're disseminated to, to their um, contacts. I just wondered, um, because I know if I went to our programs team and, and gave them a task and a deadline, it might not be taken as, as um, seriously as if it came from their own managers. So I'm just wondering if you if you could sort of give recommendations on, on how you manage to have it. Um, it's just been three years, um, and I guess since the, the first decision to work like this. And I just wonder if you could talk us through how um, you've done that, because it's quite impressive. Yeah. Oh, thank you, Catherine. Um, yeah, I think um, I think we've been really lucky and, and helped in the fact that um, we have a really um, we have a lot of strong support from our senior management. Really, the uh, a lot of this open knowledge sharing has been. Uh, Led by our CEO and um, and our head of programs as well, and they've taken quite a, a strong step and big initiative on this, um, which has helped to kind of rally up the team and um, and I also think that uh, so so it's led in that way really, um, which is which is really helpful, especially for for me. Um, but I yeah I don't think it's it's perfect yet this this culture shift, and I still think it's an ongoing process and it's still it's still underway. Um, and uh, but I do think that we're also helped by the fact we are quite a small team, um, so that I uh, I I would be able to. I know that in some organisations you wouldn't be able to necessarily locate and speak to uh, project managers that easily, whereas whereas I I know them all, so I'd be able to to contact them directly, um, which is really helpful um, as well. 
but uh, but yes, no, it is it is definitely a challenge, and especially when they've got other deadlines going on and uh, more more urgent things, it can be slipped to the bottom of the agenda. So so it's just making sure that there's that ongoing push that that that's kind of drilled in that importance of it, and it doesn't get totally forgotten. Really. Thank you, Holly. Catherine, uh, did that answer your question? And did you have any follow-up comments? Yes. Yes. Um, no, no, that, that was good. Thank you, Holly. Thank you. Thanks. So um, I think um, we have to move on to the next part now. And um, Holly will be showing us um, what the, the platform looks like. Yes, so I'll move on to the Knowledge Centre itself now. Um, so, uh, so the way that uh, I, I originally wanted to do this was to take you through the Knowledge Centre live on the website, but that turned out to be technologically difficult <laughs> because of uh, slow connections and things. So you'll just have to make do with screenshots, I'm afraid. Um, so this is what the Knowledge Centre looks like. I'm not sure whether any of you have had chance to visit yet, but um, this is what the homepage looks like anyway. And um, and so you'll see here that there's um, a little introduction to why we think knowledge sharing is so important. And also on the um, under the knowledge center now, this is actually this is a slightly older screenshot because now there's a link um, which is within this text, which takes you to a spreadsheet of all of the um, all of the resources that we have available online. Uh, so we have a total of about 200 resources available. And these resources are within these six different sections, actually probably only four of these different sections, two of them are, are links, um, they contain links. Um, so these are the six main sections of the Knowledge Centre, um, there's tools and case studies, which I'll take you through shortly, um, reports and research papers, uh, project partners, useful links and knowledge sharing workshops. And you'll also see on the right hand side, there's a, uh, a link which says help us improve, which uh, is a short feedback survey. So if any of you use our Knowledge Centre, um, I'd be hugely grateful if you could fill, fill that in because we're always looking for ways to make this uh, better and more relevant for our users. And also a um, request further information um, form underneath as well if you need any extra technical assistance. So when you go on the, uh, the tools and case studies page um, on the Knowledge Center, there's a, uh, there's a search bar, which is the best way to find the, t the resource that you're looking for. Um, so the screenshot that you'll see on your screen now um, is on the tools page, and you'll see the, um, the search toolbar at the top. And you can search by theme, country, language, year and also keywords as well you'll notice that year is actually covered by the um, selection of um, themes from uh, from the drop down list so the main uh, areas of work that transaid work in are health livelihoods uh, road safety and transport management systems and this is how we've organized our tools and case studies as split into these um, four themes but um but obviously there are some which kind of overlap and can be under multiple themes. And um, but the best way I would recommend to find the uh, the tool or case study that you're looking for would be to use uh, to search for the theme that you look at. If you work in health or if you work in road safety, to um, to use theme, select the theme that you're most interested in, and then a selection of uh, either of resources will appear underneath or. Likewise, if you're working in a specific language, if you are French speaking, select French and then all of our French resources will come up underneath. So tools. Tools are the, um, they're the practical instruments that equip TransAid and our partners um, when implementing programmes. And uh, yeah, they're based on the lessons that we've learned over the years and, uh, and they're all things that we use ourselves on our own programmes. And uh, you'll see an example of one on this uh, screenshot on, uh, on your screen right now, which is a bicycle ambulance logbook. Um, so this can be used on, well, we've used it before on a bicycle ambulance project, and it's to, uh, to log the, um, the journeys that a bicycle ambulance has taken. Um, and that's for, for their own records to indicate the impact and the success of the bicycle ambulance as a way of, um, of accessing health facilities but I'll also show you an example of another tool as well so um, 
So coming up on your screen now, shortly, there might be a little bit of a delay. Um, there's a, because uh, I thought it might be good rather than just a screenshot to see one actually in Word. And um, I'll also explain why why we have all our tools in. I think oh, sorry. you need to toggle between the two, because at the moment we can see the PowerPoint slide. But I think you, you probably need to toggle. Oh, there we go. Yeah. Yeah. Lovely. So, um, yeah, so the reason why we have them in Word is um, because we think that um, that everybody is using tools in different contexts, and so it's important that they're able to be adapted to your own needs and to the context that you're working in. And we understand a lot of these programs are very context specific. So uh, this tool that you will see on your screen right now is uh, it's called Implementing a Maternal Health Program, Assessing the Operations of Health Providers. And um, and so so there's the the title there, and then there's a short section which is about this tool, which explains what it should be used for. So this tool we've used um, as part of the maternal health program to um, to identify transport barriers to maternal health services which are faced by women in rural communities, and um, so it's essentially like a, a questionnaire template really uh, for health facilities to uh, to explain the barriers that they think that um, women face in maternal emergencies. Um, so you'll see in the top left hand corner that there's the um, Creative Commons license and this is a kind of legal um, thing which basically says that um, that uh, our, our tools are free and open to use and uh, you can adapt them to your own needs but you must always uh, credit Transaid when doing so and um, this this is basically done through the use of the logo in the top right hand corner and the watermark at the back of the page as well so uh, so yeah so that's an example of a tool there and uh, we'll move on to um, technical case studies now So how many, how many tools um, do we have now in the Transaid Knowledge uh, Centre? We have about 70 tools available online. Um, yeah, so we've got a range really. There's, uh, there's, it's mainly road safety tools, well, road safety and transport management tools. Um, like, uh, so examples would be driver training curriculum um, and uh, kind of vehicle maintenance guidelines and, and things like that. Uh, but we also have a growing amount of um, transport and health tools as well, like the one I just showed you and the bicycle ambulance logbook, and uh, and a small amount of um, access to livelihoods tools as well. So, um, yeah, we'll just wait for the uh, for the case study to come up on your screen now. Um, so I'll just explain what technical case studies are because I think sometimes the uh, the term case study can be slightly misleading because uh, it has it's often used to mean you know uh, stories of um, individual people that are kind of more in a marketing sense but uh, but that's not how how we tend to use it it's more they're more technical than that so they're um, two page outlines of programs and activities that Transaid has worked on. And uh, they provide a clear and technical overview of um, of a project. So the how the background, um, how it came about, the um, the methodology, the steps that we went through, and um, the conclusions and the recommendations. And as I mentioned earlier, they're often very open and honest about um, about the challenges we faced and uh, and how we attempted to overcome them, and the recommendations that we have as well. Um, so so yeah, so they. So it should be up on your screen now. So this is an example of a uh, technical case study where we um, developed a, a driver training curriculum, um, an instructor's manual for drivers of large commercial vehicles um, for the East African community. Um, this was earlier this year. And so in this uh, box in the top left hand corner, you'll see the location of the project. So this one spreads the East Africa community, the start date and the duration. And, uh, and then the entire, I won't, won't take you through the entire document, um, but it basically goes through the steps that we went through to, uh, to develop this curriculum and instructor's manual. Um, the outcomes, so the outcome was, was essentially the, the curriculum and the instructor's manual. And then the conclusion, which, uh, which includes um, recommendations on how this curriculum and instructor's manual should be rolled out and implemented. 
And uh, you'll also notice um, if the writing's not too small and if the the connection's not too bad that the um, that there's also a tools develop section uh, which varies from case study to case study. Sometimes it's tools developed, sometimes it's tools utilised. So um, so if you say say the ideal situation is that you're working. Uh, on a program which is developing a driver training curriculum in another region of Africa, um, you read this technical case study, see the steps that we went through, and then look at the end where it says tools developed, see uh, these are the tools that were developed through this project, um, and then look for them in the tools section of the website, and there they are, and you're able to see them. So um, maybe, Holly, yeah. if you highlight um, the section oh. where the tools are shown. Ah. Okay, there we go. Thank you. Maybe you'll be able to see that highlighted now. Yeah, so that's where it is. And I'll show you briefly how that looks on the uh, on the actual knowledge centre. So uh, so I've switched to the uh, the knowledge centre page now live. So let's see whether this works. But the way that it works is that um, so you found this case study um, which is about developing a driver training curriculum. And, um, and then there's the download at the bottom of the page. And then on the right, it will say other articles that may be of interest. And it will have the driver training curriculum for passenger service vehicles and the driver training curriculum for heavy goods vehicles that, uh, that we've used and developed with our partners. So I don't know whether that... It's coming up yeah. now, yeah. Oh, great. So yeah, in terms of technical case studies, we have approximately 60 online on the Knowledge Centre and um, they detail, I, I would say, most of our projects really. And uh, it's just a case of making sure that they're updated and um, kept up to date with the new activities and the new programmes that we're working on. Um, so we have, we have quite a, a range of case studies. I think, yeah, with the tools, probably it's slightly more biased towards road safety and transport management, whereas the case studies, there's a pretty equal spread, really. So I'll take you back to the presentation now. And, uh, and I think we're going to do a quick poll, unless we have any questions first. I think, I think we'll go ahead with the poll now yeah. and um, maybe take some questions a bit later. Great. So, uh, so this poll... Uh, it should come up on your screen now. So the question is, what type of resources would be most useful for you to see on the Knowledge Centre? And uh, and if you could just vote for us, that would be uh, fantastic. It would be really useful to us to see um, the kind of material that people are most interested in. So the options are technical case studies, uh, which I've just taken you through, um, transport management tools, driver training tools, transport and health tools, and also other as well. If you um, if you have any other suggestions, I'd be really interested to hear them. So we can see that some people have started voting. So that's good. We have. Uh, oh, it's quite uh, evenly spread. Oh, it's changing now. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> we're waiting to uh, for everybody to vote, and then we can read out the results. Interesting. So 82% of people have voted. Still like waiting for a couple of people, I think. Maybe one more. <laughs> this is nearly there. Nearly there, yeah, <laughs> yeah. We're still waiting for one more. I can see that uh, Luke, um, I think, had his hand up. Oh, no, it's not up anymore. Oh, yes, it is. Oh, there, yes. we go. <laughs> there it is. Okay, go ahead, Luke. Yeah, hi. Well, I was just wondering whether or not you provide kind of situation analyses of the transport barriers that are being experienced in different countries or different areas that you're working in that you, would, that you are intending to make available, or is that not something that you're... Sorry. Yes, Caroline will respond to this. Hi, Luke. It's Caroline here. Thanks. That's a very good question. Um, I think the the short answer is that we um, most of that sort of information isn't available on the 
knowledge center because things change so rapidly. Um, and I suppose to Tom's very good question earlier about putting information out there, um, we're very happy to put tools that can be adapted and share our reports that are obviously historical or at a certain period in time. Um, we do have a number of situation analysis for a number of countries that we've been working in. Um, and we would usually share those through the means such as a technical case study and it would summarize some of the challenges. So for example, in Madagascar, describing the regions we're working, what some of the challenges are and what some of the solutions might, might be. But really, I think that's where people tend to come, would tend to come to us to ask us, I see you're working here or are you working in these countries and what might be available? So if that was a general question, Luke, I think it's the sort of thing that we, um, we don't share specific detail because I, I, you know, things do change so quickly, types of transport being used um, to a lesser extent, the terrain, but certainly political situation, et cetera. So, um, but if that was coming from you or wanting to see different situation analyses that we had for different countries, maybe just contact us directly and we, we can make available what we have. Thank you, Caroline. Um, Luke, um, did that answer your question all right? Yes, thanks, Karen. Great. Right, I, I think now um, we're going to close the poll. And um, so we have, uh, okay, just, just read out the answers. Uh, there was 50% of technical case studies, 30% transport and health tools, and 10% each for transport management tools and driver training tools. Thank you very much for taking part in this. And now um, Holly will carry on uh, and talk us talk to us about reports. Yeah. So uh, I just thought I mentioned as well, um, kind of following on from what Caroline just said as well, is that um, I think another key part of our um, knowledge sharing initiative is that we. Um, we do really encourage people to get in touch with us as well. Like we, um, we're happy to speak over the phone and provide our own uh, technical advice as well, um, because we understand that a lot of the documents that we share are, are quite technical and might need a little bit of extra context as well. So, uh, so yeah, it's it's also a part of how we uh, how we try to share knowledge. So. Um, so yeah, so on our uh, another section of the Knowledge Centre is reports and research papers. So uh, this is quite a small section at the moment uh, because we're not really a, a research organisation, but there are a few projects that we've worked on where we have done some research, and we feel like this is important to share. And uh, and we do have a few reports online as well, and uh, you'll see on your screen that there's a couple of examples which um, which I've shared there as well. Um, and then uh, another section of the um, Knowledge Centre is uh, knowledge sharing workshops. So, um, so I feel like this this section is quite um, interesting and useful as well, because um, because so often people attend these conferences and workshops, and so much learning is hap happens in the room, and so much knowledge is generated, but then it just kind of stops and then is left there in the room. Uh, but uh, so we've created this section of, uh, of the Knowledge Centre to encourage the conversation to continue. Um, in, and I don't mean that in a way like it's a uh, discussion forum, but uh, just in the way that the presentations from the workshop can be shared and accessed um, by everybody. So not only for the people who attended the workshop, but also for people who have a, an interest in the workshop as well. And, um, and then any documents that, have hap that are relevant and have happened as a result of the workshop and then, uh, then also, um, Transaid can well Transaid and the Knowledge Centre can act as a sort of central point for for if uh, people think of new ideas that would be useful to share with the workshop participants, they can send it through to us, and then we can share on this section of the website. Um, so an example of this is uh, from a workshop that uh, we helped to organise in uh, March 2014, where we had. Um, where we, uh, it was an emergency transport workshop where we had uh, a, huge, a large group of uh, health professionals and transport professionals come together to discuss ideas to improve access to emergency services in rural areas of Africa. And, uh, and this was a huge knowledge sharing event. There was, um, there was a lot that was, uh, that was generated from this workshop and now part of the knowledge sharing workshop section is dedicated to that specific workshop where there's all the presentations available 
and uh, and then a lot of the documents as well available online. So um, on the uh, so the final two sections of the knowledge centre are project partners and useful links. And uh, the reason why these are included in the knowledge centre is because we don't we we don't want to portray ourselves, and we certainly don't believe that we are the owners and of all the knowledge that there is in transport and development and we understand that there's a lot of incredibly valuable work being done by other organizations as well so uh, so these these two sections allow us the opportunity to link out to those other organizations as well so the uh, project partners section um, has a list of all the partners that we work with on our um, on our various projects and um, and links to their website so say for example somebody reads a technical case study and it says that we worked with a specific partner and uh, people want to find out more information about that about that organization they can search for them in the project partners section and then find their website as well um, and then the useful links section is uh, so these are similar similar sections but there's there's a bit of a key difference in that useful links is um, links to other knowledge hubs and other useful um, knowledge repositories which uh, which we also use in our own work and that we think um, should be shared as well and um, and so that we hope with uh, as the knowledge center grows we want to forge more of these links and um, and encourage this open sharing uh, really we don't uh, we don't intend to become a um, a knowledge library where uh, where we host all the documents but we're always happy to link out to other people's documents as well so we've had a few instances where people have um, emailed us and said oh um would you be able to to share this this document uh, that we've developed and uh, we've been able to link to that document from our useful links page um so success so far um what kind of uh, impact are we hoping to achieve? Um, as I said earlier, we're noticing that the more we're sharing, the more people are getting in touch. And uh, and then as a result of this, um, the more our knowledge and experience can support other development programs. So we've had some, some good feedback so far from, as you'll see on the screen, there's uh, some pretty great quotes from WHO, UNICEF and Millennium Villages projects. So, um, so I think that, having these these tools and these material available online um, has been useful to other people and I think as I click through there'll be some examples of logos from them um, from other organizations that have got in touch so uh, so yeah as, as I said we hugely encourage people getting in touch with us um, asking for more information and providing us with feedback as well because um, because we uh, we're always looking for ways to improve. So um, so you'll see at the bottom there's a, a link to um, to our Survey Monkey uh, feedback survey, which uh, which you can also access through the website. So if you if you could fill that in, that would be fantastic. Um, and just a couple of stats as well. Um, you'll see that uh, so this is this is kind of pre pre launch really the the table the graph on the left. Um, but it shows that the more that we're sharing, the more people are visiting us. And um, and then you'll also see on the pie chart that the uh, the regions that are visiting us are quite interesting as well, because we're we're trying to reach um, reach the relevant people. And uh, and you'll see that well, mainly it's United Kingdom really, because we are a UK-based organisation. But then we also have quite a significant chunk from Africa as well, which is great because that's the the region that we mainly work in. So what do we have planned for the future of the Knowledge Centre? Um, that will be the next slide that comes up on your screen. And um, so basically, we it's really important that the Knowledge Centre is regularly maintained and updated to keep it relevant and up to date. Um, we try to do this by posting new, uh, new technical case studies from the projects that we're working on. And um, as new tools are developed, upload them straight away. And, um, and then we're also, as I said earlier, um, increasing the amount of French material we have online uh, that's that's in the immediate future and um, and then we also uh, hoping to develop a new section of the knowledge center which will be how-to guides which uh, which will be guidelines um, that kind of bridge the gap between the technical case studies and the tools the technical case studies will provide an example of um, of how we've implemented a project the tools will be 
the tools that you use on the project and then the how-to guides will kind of be more guidelines on them um, and how to do this um, and um, and so yeah so then underneath you'll see I've seen I've written time to share and um, and this is uh, not only for trans aid we believe that it's the time for us to share but we also feel uh, more widely than us that it's the time for us all to share um, throughout all development organizations because essentially we're all working towards the same goal so uh, so why be precious over our knowledge and I think that uh, it is time to um, to openly share uh, all of the learning and there is a lot of learning that happens uh, all the time and it's such a shame when this gets wasted so we're hoping that the Knowledge Centre is some sort of catalyst uh, for the open sharing of knowledge in the transport and development sector and uh, we hope that this happens more and more and um, so thank you hugely for attending today and um, and we I hope that you'll be part of this. Yeah. And so I think now we're we're going to, going to open for more questions or uh, potentially also some thoughts or comments or if anybody wants to share specific experience with um, having to research uh, the transport or logistics component of international development uh, projects, we would be really happy to hear um, some of your experiences. So, yes, so Tom, hi. Hi, um, first of all, thank you very much for the presentation. It's really excellent work that you're doing. Um, and how this should work is in terms of knowledge sharing, sharing um, as kind of a two-way process. The issue I always... Um, have though a lot of the time when thinking about what we're putting out on our own website and resources is that um, we want organizations particularly in the developing world to critically engage with our materials and think okay that one's relevant that tool that piece of information isn't relevant to our situation um, but the the issue I always have a fear is because when you're a big, well-respected organization like TransAid, um, based, in, um, based in the UK and offering well-made uh, tools and resources, that puts um, organizations like ours in very powerful positions internationally. And I just always worry that people will in other parts of the world take what we say as kind of uh, gospel truth and what we are doing is always right when in fact um, the ideal situation is getting that critical engagement with our materials. Um, mm -hmm. I'm wondering if this is kind of what ways forward are there in helping organizations particularly in the developing world to you know take things, use the things that are useful and use things in their own particular contexts. I think Caroline will answer this one, Tom. Thank you. Thanks, Tom. No, it's a really considered question. Um, I think probably the first thing to note is that most of the, most of the, I speak specifically for the tools here, but most of the tools that we have available online were actually developed um, directly as outputs um, from the programs that we're working and it, in almost every case in partnership with um, with either governments in Africa or with um, NGO partners on the ground. So for example, the examples Holly showed you earlier of um, the driver training curriculum produced for the East Africa community. Um, we did provide technical assistance to a government training institution in Tanzania, but then there was very much that stakeholder participation and, and as you say, you know, that sort of critical engagement in the materials. So I think whilst they are on here in a unified format and with a, a TransAid watermark, um, and it's always with the permission of partners um, who are also all credited on the, the case studies, I think it's probably fair to say that almost all of the tools there have been through a process of... Um, of, of different feedback and engagement from partners and for example the bicycle ambulance logbook that was shown that's a 
a tool that we're using with um, on a program with three other partners that we're implementing in, in Zambia. So I think we think of that really as a quite an all, a sort of ongoing process. And we often update the tools as well if we find that it's been adapted to be used on another program. And also linking to Holly's point about why we, we did have a, a big debate here at the beginning to put them up in, in a PDF in order to in, protect some of the integrity and the quality of the information. But then we decided that, no, let's put them up in a word with this Creative Commons license so that people can adapt to the context and, and indeed improve on what we've done, feedback to us, and we'll adapt our tools based on that feedback we get. So I hope that goes some way, part way to answering Tom. But I, I think um, the important thing is to keep that information flow going both ways and, and being very ready to adapt to what we have and not be precious that this is the absolutely right way to do things because I think most of the best solutions and the sustainable solutions are really generated from the field. Thank you, Caroline. Tom, did you have any um, follow-up comments? No, no, thank you. Um, thank you very much indeed. Now, I mean, it's clear they're very well considered, very developed resources, and that's really important. So um, they're excellent tools to get for people all over the world. Thank you, Tom. That's great. Um, do we have any other questions? I think uh, we're nearing the time where we're, we'll have to, um, to stop. Um, so I'm just giving you a couple of people an opp last opportunity to ask a question. But at the moment, I think uh, we don't have anybody who's uh, wanting to ask a question. So I think what's left uh, for us to say is, uh, you know, we, we thank you very much for attending this webinar. Um, and um, we'd like to ask you a couple of things, if we may. Uh, first of all is if you enjoyed the webinar, and you felt that it was helpful, then it would be really, really appreciated if you could spread the word, um, and uh, most, mostly about the obviously the knowledge center as well. Um, and um, we, you'll see when you when you close your webinar window, uh, there'll be a small survey that will pop up, and it's only three or four questions. Uh, so it would be really amazing if you could take a couple of minutes to answer those questions. That would be really helpful for for our um, improving process, basically. But um, yes, thank you, thank you all again very much. And uh, as you can see on the slide uh, on your screens, you can contact us through the following details. So um, don't hesitate. Thank you all. Thank you very much. Thanks everybody.